Good morning, everyone. Uh, like I say, when I sent out the, uh, the message, uh, my jury summons changed, and uh, I may end up having to request a, a postponement uh, so that I, if I'm needed to serve, it won't, it won't be something that will take up uh, many days uh, from, the, from the term. So uh, that does happen. And so uh, again, uh, the, the flow of communication with technology is, is, is very good and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, back in the olden days, uh, I may have been leaving a note on my office door uh, <laughs> or, or trying to send out phone calls or whatever. So uh, we are certainly uh, privileged to have uh, uh, technology to communicate. So uh, thank you for uh, keeping uh, <clears throat> up on your uh, email messages and Blackboard messages. Today, um, what I want to cover uh, is a new topic. <clears throat> and if I have some time, I may do another example uh, from what we did last time. I, I think we, we've covered quite a few examples with that and it may be unnecessary. Um, but what we want to start with today is the idea of para, parametrizing, parametrizing, that's a new word, curves uh, in terms of what we call parametric equations. So, so we, we think of a function uh, y equal f of x as defining a curve in the plane. What we, what we want to do is, I mean, actually that's a parametric equation if you think of x as the parameter and then f of x is y. So that's really a parametric representation. Uh, we wanna take that idea and extend it even more to where we basically have any parameter we want, not necessarily that given by the graph, uh, but maybe any parameter where we have a a uh, function of the parameter parameter for x and a function for the parameter uh, for y coordinate. For instance, we have x comma y that will describe the actual curve. And so <clears throat> I'm sure that was clear as mud. So what I want to do is start with a very nice geometric example. Um, again, we've been dealing with parametric equations all along. We just never called it that. So the first thing I want to do is I want to share my screen of, of something that, that I have actually drawn up from the uh, from your uh, section uh, chapter in chapter uh, 10, section two. So let me see if I can find that. So let's see here. Okay, here we go. So the first thing, what I've done, you see this Adobe, I've, I've enlarged this a little bit so you can see what's going on. So I'll make it a little bit bigger. And I want to generalize this, but I thought the easiest thing to do would be to draw this. I have this written up in the notes, but I've done this a little bit differently to keep with a more simple example, and then we can actually uh, uh, generalize it. <clears throat> so the idea is, this makes a good geometric example with trigonometry. And what we're gonna to try to generate, you can see this red curve is going to be the curve we want to parameterize. And what do we call it? We call it the epicycloid. And it is, what we have is a circle of radius one on the outside right here. This is the circle of radius one and it's rolling outside a circle of radius two. So here's our radius two circle, here's our radius one, and it starts to roll. Now, what you notice here, I've done the computations that I'm gonna work through, but I can't really do them without a good picture. And, and again, trying to draw this and making it look at least this nice would be a little bit uh, difficult, and I don't want you to be struggling with this. So, so the idea is first, and, and I'll just go ahead and scroll down. This is how we come up with our parametric equations, but it's all geometric. Notice we have a formula for the X coordinate and a formula for the Y coordinate. Now, this is a little bit challenging, but this is how I get your attention. And geometry always gets your attention because we struggle with geometry and, and we struggle with trigonometry. Uh, as calculus students, I, I'm very aware of where the issues are. So. 
This larger circle, let's just go and note that it has a radius of two. So it has a circumference two pi r, which is four pi. The smaller circle, which we're starting right here, and notice I've given you two transitional circles and the curve that it's generating. The idea is that the smaller circle has radius one, so it basically has a circumference of two pi. So what happens is that we have this point right here on the smaller circle and we start rolling the circle and this point, it, it, it just stuck on the circle and it traces out this curve. So here's the thing, as we look here, one quarter, one quarter of the larger circle is pi, but that's half the smaller circle. So if this point is what's tracing out the curve, by the time we go around a quarter of the larger circle, circle, this point has moved over here and we end up with this transitional period. So you're thinking you've got a cusp here and as it continues to go around, you're gonna get another cusp here. That's what the epicycloid is. And depending on the sizes of the radii will be a function of how many cusps that you get. Now, I didn't wanna start out with a generalized version like you see in the notes because that's too complicated. So I thought I'd start with a real simple case. Now, the way you actually come up with equations, for instance, I take here this little blob right here is this really important point and I, and I colored over it many times. This is the point P, X, Y. That's what we want to describe. We want a formula for X and a formula for Y that describes the red curve here, okay? So first what I've done is I've simply taken our parameter be, to be the theta here, which is the central angle of the larger circle, and then, then our transitional curve here. Now, what does that mean geometrically? Now, of course, you can see x, and, and I've dropped the perpendicular here, is this distance O to E, and y, if you look here, is this distance c to d. So I've taken all these important points and labeled them. For instance, we extend from the center of the larger circle to the center of the transitional circle that's rolling around the outside. And I call this point O and this B, this is completely arbitrary. And what's nice is that, that uh, in your uh, textbook, they have a nice transitional picture like this, which gives you an idea of how to set this up. And then of course, I take this point to be A, I don't think I ever used it, uh, but, but I did use it as an arc. So that was important. So I just started labeling the P here, and then I dropped the perpendicular here to C and then just draw the horizontal parallel to the X axis. And then of course, drop the perpendicular here to form a nice right triangle. And then of course, this perpendicular forms a nice smaller right triangle right here. And so basically by showing the existence of these right triangles, we can use some trigonometry and some simple trigonometry. But what I'm saying in this case, this, this is very much contingent on getting a stylistic picture that can introduce the correct geometry. In many cases, we can just employ the algebra, but I wanted you to see a particular case from physics and engineering. These are important curves and you will see them later, um, especially in uh, calculus three. I wanted you to see how you can basically use your trig and your geometry to come up with some really nice equations. Now is what, Professor Ron doing here unique? No, not necessarily, but it certainly is a method that works. So let's just see how we get this going. Notice, notice here, this is, this basically justifies why the picture looks like this. So I didn't want you to think I was just making this up. Now, if we look at angle A, B, C right here, this is the other acute angle of the big rectangle. Well, it's a complement of theta. So that's the simplest part. Angle A, B, C is pi over two minus theta, the complement. And now what I want you to do is look at this arc right here, AP. I put a little arc sign over it, AP. This radius is one. And so therefore, remember we have S is R theta. 
So we just have one times the central angle, which is ABP right here. Now, when you look at this and you think, now, now notice again, ABP right here. That's the central angle of this arc AP right there, okay? And so then you're thinking, all right, well, that's, what is that relative to the larger circle? Well, as you roll along, this arc will be equivalent to this arc because the smaller circle is rolling along the larger circle. But that arc is really easy. That's just gonna be the radius times theta, two theta, which I have here, larger circle. So when you look at this and you think, okay, well, this gives us a way to uh, look at this arc and angle A, B, P. So angle A, B, P right here. And now if we notice, this is gonna give us the, the other angle that we need, angle C, B, P. So when we look at this, we take this angle, A, B, P, and we subtract the complement right here to get the smaller angle. So, so when we get this part right here, it's like, that's just like a gift. And that's why I like this simpler radius two, radius one. So then we say two theta minus this angle that we've computed right here to get the smaller angle C, B, P right here. Now I do a little bit of just algebra. And in this case, we have minus the negative. So we have three theta minus pi over two. Now, what I've noticed here is that this is starting to look like the co-function identities. And this is a trick that you use in differential geometry. So what I did, I went ahead and flipped this around so that I have the pi over two first and then the negative factor. So this is starting to mimic, as you see down here, the co-function identities. Now, that's what I thought about. And that was an afterthought when I started working down here and I went back up here and I put this box and put a little railroad track there saying this is very important. Now, again, what we wanna do is just utilize the basic trigonometric aspects of the big triangle. Now, first notice, if we want to get the coordinate for X, we need all the way from O to E. And we're gonna actually chop that up so we can do that. You can notice here, we're gonna to look to find OD and then CP. And if CP is congruent to DE, that'll give us what we need. So I'm kind of showing you this is how we can actually attempt this in a very simple way. Now, first, OD is the easy part. We'll just take, in this particular case, cosine of theta. So that's adjacent over hypotenuse. And so in this particular case, what we can see is we get, uh, for instance, cosine, which is OD over the hypotenuse. And, and notice, notice in this particular case, this is, this is very interesting. When we think about this, we have the hypotenuse of three because it extends all the way from O to B, two plus one, three. So we get OD is three times cosine theta. Now, of course, let's just not finish with that. We can get BD right here using the sine. So we'll say opposite over hypotenuse. Again, A, th this radius plus this radius is three. Hypotenuse is three. Sine theta BD over three. So BD is three sine theta. So now you can see, notice here, I've got BD minus BC. That's going to give us the Y coordinate here that we need. If we subtract from the larger segment here, this smaller, that gives us the Y coordinate. So this is just simple segment algebra here. And so when you think about this, you're like, okay, I can do the trig. Now, now we have one more aspect here. We need to find this distance here, right here of the smaller triangle. And we need to find this distance here of the smaller triangle. So now we can use basic trig again, like we did here. So we've got the sine of C, PB, you see why I've got this figure here. This makes this all doable. Otherwise, this would be an impossibility. So we have opposite over hypotenuse. So that's CP over one, because this particular circle has radius one. So we have CP is equal to angle CBP. But Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> it's right there. Now we're thinking, okay, so that sign of this, well, good. 
this negative factors because sine is what? An odd function. And this is the co-function identity. Sine of pi over two minus three theta is just cosine of three theta by co-function. So that's why I did that. Boom, right there. Now we also need BC. We need this distance. So we'll use the cosine. Cosine of angle C BP will now be adjacent over hypotenuse. So that gives us BC, the one, that's a freebie. So BC is now the cosine of angle CBP, which we have in the box here. But of course the cosine is even, so the negative absorbs. Co-function identity, sine three theta. Now, what I just went through is not difficult. A trig student could do this. However, when it comes to setting these things up, if you had just been plopped with this uh, idea and you're like, mm, I don't really know how to do this, Professor Ron. This is how you basically have to construct these equations. You've got to look at the geometry like you're doing a physics problem. And so we find that in order to do engineering and physics, we need to know a lot of geometry, a lot of algebra, a lot of trig, and then a lot of calculus. So this makes a really, really nice example. Now let's just see how we can put all this together which now, now you can see the method to the madness. And I kept alluding to this. We have all the ingredients here. So we have O to D plus C to P. That will give us O to E, which is the X coordinate. So O D, we just go over here and say, well, O D is three cosine theta right here. And C P, which is right here, is minus three cosine three theta, right there, boom. And B, and in this case, Y, again, Y is this distance right here, CD or PE, but we're just gonna focus on this because these are the actual segments that we know a lot about. So we're gonna say BD minus BC to give us CD, which is the Y coordinate. And so BD, which we see right here is three sine theta, and then minus BC, which is minus sine three theta. And there you have it. Now, the key again, I, I, like I say before class, I just took a scan of this, an Adobe scan, so I could blow this up so you could see it. And you also see this written up in the uh, uh, lecture notes, but I decided uh, when I was preparing for the lecture, I said it's easier for the students if we think of this in terms of how this is initially stated in your, in your book. That is where we have a, a radius of two for the larger circle and a radius of one. It keeps the algebra a lot simpler. So we can actually generalize this, but I think if you start with the generalization, the, the picture gets too crowded. So what I've tried to do here, ladies and gentlemen, is keep the algebra simple, but you can see how this is completely dependent on the transitional picture that I have here. This is, this is the key to the argument. We often find, just like when we do optimization problems, we haven't had to do that so much in this class until now, basically, but let's think about it. When we started the class with the of uh, applications of the integral, we often found that it was nice to draw a little schematic so we could see what the picture looked like, what region we were finding the area of, or what region we were actually revolving. So we found that to be very useful. However, we got to the techniques of integration in infinite series, we didn't need as many pictures because it was more number theoretic, more arithmetic. So, so we're finding that we've got this balancing act act between the schematics and, and the arithmetic. Now, of course, uh, again, I try to introduce these concepts to my pre-calculus class. And of course, by the time they get to Cal 2, they've forgotten a lot, but, but it does come back. But what I wanted to focus on here, and I wanted to blow this up, and, and I want you to master this argument. It's not difficult. I've given you all the ingredients. I always give you the path to success. Uh, as one student said, you give us everything we need to know as long as we study forever. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's what, that's what the STEM major requires. Uh, it is exacting and it is difficult. But here's the key, ladies and gentlemen, the large triangle right here 
and the small ones. So you can do your picture just like this. You can use any letters you want. I don't care. I There was nothing uh, sacred about the letters I chose here. But the main thing is that we see these two triangles. And again, you could have a different transitional picture, but I tried to draw one that was simple. And even you, in your book, they suggest this. So it makes the it makes the process a little bit easier if you can think about a transitional picture that covers all the, the, the bases, so to speak. And so now you can think the parameter can be a real number. All of these are always defined and we could run from uh, zero to two pi and cover basically the circle, so to speak, and have a cusp here and then another cusp right back here. So we're thinking eventually we may be looking at these in terms of arc length once we define the calculus for the parametric equations, which will be connected to the calculus we've already done uh, for arc length. So again, I wanted to share this with you. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what we've done here and we're going to generalize it. I generalize these equations very simply, and then we'll do some examples. So let me share this with you and we'll compare to what we already have. So let me go back to my, uh, um, yeah, document cam. Okay, now this is what I wanted to share with you as far as the generalization. Note here, you might, there's a web assigned problem that discusses this example. And the idea is that I want to take what I have here and make it more general. So what I'm going to do, and it's very easy to do, and you get nice adjusted equations. That is, in this case, the parametric equations can be generalized. We're going to let A be the radius of the larger stationary circle and let B, where B is less than A, be the radius of the smaller moving circle. So now, and, and this is why I made this decision of when I was preparing lecture to do the simpler case first and then to generalize. That way this, this algebra is very simple. You can see all of this. The only thing that was maybe a little bit difficult was the co-function because maybe you've forgotten that. But, but you can look on the uh, uh, PDF that I sent you that has all those nice formulas on it. Uh, as a review, but this is basic. That's just a right triangle. I mean, that, that's basically general math. So now what we can do is we can now adjust everything. That is now, and you can look through this angle CBB, BP will now be, if we compare here, we'll have this particular uh, coefficient A plus B divided by B times theta, and then what we can see is that CP here, this will now be negative B cosine A plus B over B times theta. So this will give us a coefficient that makes the process more generalized. We can do the same thing for OD and BD. Now, again, again, the, the key here is just to think about what we've done before, where now you just go in here and every place we used a two, you can use A in every place we used a one, you can use a B. And this gives you very nice equations here that are very user friendly. So if we compare the two here, notice in place of the three, basically the sum of the radii, we get the, the generalized sum. And in place of the three theta, we get A plus B divided by B theta. So, so the, the generalization is somewhat comparable. But now with this generalization, you can pick whatever values of A and B that you want. And if they're nice numbers, then you get a pretty picture. Otherwise, it's not very symmetric. So this is what you will see when you, when you do your web assign problem to have the generalized equation that makes the process very simple. You don't have to go back and rework all of this. I've, I've set this up for you and I want you to understand it and then use the generalized equations to fill in. 
So you might be working a physics problem or an engineering problem and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't remember that derivation. Oh, but I do remember the generalized equations that Professor Ron gave me. And this is how they're stated in the textbook, which I thought was kind of neat. I looked at the end of the uh, uh, section, which I actually used to prepare my lecture notes that are on Blackboard, and they use the uppercase A and B for the uh, generalized radii. So this gives you a nice, convenient parameterization. So again, you might be thinking the parameter is theta, and we have a formula for the x coordinate and a formula for the y coordinate. So again, any, any functional equation gives you a simple parameterization where x is the parameter, okay? You always have that for free. And those are often very convenient parameterizations when you, you're gonna find that out in calculus. We'll say parameterized by the graph. We'll just say, just use the automatic parameterization of the graph. But what we wanna do now is maybe take that a little bit further and give you some examples with, with this. So I always like to start with this. Again, this was my picture from my notes, which was a lot smaller. Um, and, and maybe you could see this just as well, but I blew it up with the PDF. So this is what the original looked like uh, when I was preparing this lecture. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take this idea to do some more simple examples. Now, when it comes to parametric equations, for instance, let me just, I, I've been harping all this time. It's like when you do a, uh, regular uh, function, for instance, say, say we had something like this. Say we had f of x equals the square root of x. Okay, you're thinking, well, that's college algebra, Professor Ron. So we could, when I say parameterization by the graph, we could just say, we could say let x equal x, and we could say y is just the square root of x. You're thinking, well, that's so simple. So now we could think of a vector function. We could say, well, r of x is just x comma square root of x, where x is the parameter. And we just say x is greater than or equal to zero. So this would be a parameterization of the square root curve just using the functional equation, not having to do anything. And then you're thinking, well, maybe, maybe you're doing an algorithm where you want to use t as the parameter or theta. So for instance, say you, say you wanted to use a different parameter, you could just say r of t will now be t comma square root of t. And, and say maybe you only want your curve to go from zero to three, like that. The nice thing about the parameterization is that it is very convenient for the operations of vectors, very convenient for the dot product, for the, for the uh, cross product when, when it's defined, very convenient for the theory of curves, okay? So we, we often need a more generalized way of defining a curve. And that's what the parametric equations do. So the thing is, you could say, all right, well, I don't, I don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this. I already know what this looks like. So you can say zero to three, and then you've got one and two, about square root three, about right there. And so you could sketch the curve and it stops there and as t as t increases so does x and y they both increase and so you get an orientation with the parameterization you get an orientation of the curve it's like what's the direction of traversal so we'll say orientation orientation corresponds to direction of traversal. So you say when we, you traverse the curve, you're like a little ant walking along the curve. What's the direction of trans, transversal? So when you traverse the curve, 
you you want to know, well, okay, so I start here and I end here, or if I start here and I go on infinitely, uh, you know, I'm going in this direction, or I'm starting here and moving in this direction. So traverse the curve, so to speak. So so again, the parameterization, though right now seems a little bit odd, is very useful. And when you get to calculus three, it'll be like, boom, you get to chapter 12 or whatever book you're using, and you're doing uh, uh, the theory of curves and you get to curvature and, and the uh, TNB frame to define curves that moves along a curve, the unit tangent, unit normal, unit binormal, that's all tied into differential geometry. And this is the, the playing field, the parameterization for curves that, that is necessary for that. Now, let's look at an example. We've got several examples here to make this a little bit more doable. Let me adjust the, the, the uh, document cam. So let's look at another example. So I want you to realize that for right now, we, we have other examples that I haven't even discussed, but every functional equation gives you an automatic parameterization, okay? Automatic using the independent variable as the parameter, or you can use any letter you want, but you didn't have to do any work here because you already had that information. Now, what we want to do at this point is to look at some parameterizations and we would like to sketch the curve, sketch curve. And basically what that's gonna mean is eliminate the parameter. Right now we need to figure out what parameterizations look like uh, because they may not be available to us. And we want to, uh, that is provide orientation. That is, once we have a parameterization, we need to figure out how are we traversing the curve? What's the direction of traversal? Like we think about trigonometry, usually it's the counterclockwise when we think about the unit circle, as long as we're moving from zero to say two pi. So that's gonna be easy. And in most cases, it'll be as simple as doing this, but you're thinking, are we gonna introduce calculus for this? Absolutely, absolutely. This is a calculus class. So the next section will be the calculus of the parametric equations. So here's a parameterization. If, if this, the, the initial example to me, I thought is a lot of fun. I, I, take, I take a lot of interest in, in looking at geometry of things. I love geometry and number theory and the basic trigonometry provided us with a blueprint to do the equations for the epicycloid. So not, not all parameterizations will be that difficult. I mean, but it, it, when you think about it, once you get started and you look at the triangles, it's very straightforward. And so you'll, you'll, you'll be a lot more comfortable once you look back through that. Now, here's a parameterization. Now, you notice what I did up here, ladies and gentlemen, I just said, okay, you know, kind of look at this like a vector function. So we could say like R of T, the X coordinate is 2T. This is gonna be the notation from calculus three and the Y coordinate is this. So when you look at this, you're thinking there is no specification for T. So T could be any number. And of course, when you look at this, there are no restrictions on T. I mean, it's just a defined for all real numbers. So you're thinking, uh, what is this? And, and then of course, with, with a parameterization, you don't want to plot points. We never do that. We want to use what we already know to figure this out. So why, why do I like this notation? Because this notation is nice for calculus. You, when, you, when you do vector differentiation in calculus three, this is gonna set you up for that. And the notation that we use here, I'm surprised Dr. Larson doesn't make more of use of it uh, uh, in this chapter, but it's okay. Uh, his book is excellent and it provides a nice groundwork for this and framework. So we think about this and say, well, let's just, let's figure out what this is. I think, you know, this represents a line, but let's, let's prove that. So we're going to eliminate the parameter. So first now, if we look at this, if and only if we have 2t equals x plus 3. So boy, this is a big departure from the from the infinite series and, and maybe refreshing. You're thinking this is, yay, break from the uh, infinite series. 
and then 3t equals uh, y minus one. Okay, so that just basic general math, right? Algebra one. And then of course, t is x plus three over two. And we have t equals y minus one over three. So when you look at this, you, you have two equations that are uh, equivalent to the parameter. So just like in algebra, you're thinking, well, we can set them equal and we'll have an equation in X and Y, which is the Cartesian, the Cartesian, right up here, Cartesian, Cartesian, Y equal F of X, right? Cartesian, parametric, Cartesian, okay? So now you say, okay, X plus three over two equals y minus one over two. Maybe I should have started with this, but of course, if I had started with this, you'd be asleep by now. I got your attention with the epicycloid. So now when we multiply, this gives us a two y minus two. And uh, sorry, I've got a little typo here. Let me put the three where we need it. And then we get a three x plus a nine. So now if you like, <clears throat> you can throw everything on one side or equals whatever, at this point, it doesn't really matter. So we could have three X, um, <clears throat> let's take the Y over minus two Y equals in this case, a negative 11. So that would be one way <clears throat> of, of drawing the equation of the line. <clears throat> Notice you're thinking you could do this in, uh, you know, slope intercept form or, or whatever, in any number of ways. And of course, we could just take the 11 over and have it equal to zero. So this is kind of the standard form for a linear equation. And so now <clears throat> you're looking at this, this is clearly a line. <clears throat> so if you like, we can set X to zero. So if we do that, we get the point uh, zero. And then of course, 11 over two. <clears throat> and set y equal to zero, like we're in finite math, right? Okay, so if y is equal to zero, then we have x is negative 11 over three. <clears throat> so we can get just a simple sketch of this. Again, very simple, but new, a new way of looking at things. And you're thinking when you're doing curve theory, <clears throat> this will be a lot more convenient way to represent a line. And we'll talk about how you could actually do this if you just started with points, I'll show you how to do that. Now, of course here, this is five and a half. So we'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, about right there. And then uh, we've got what, uh, negative three and two thirds. Again, not Rembrandt, but close enough. So here's our representation from this parameterization. And now of course we can see here, at least from T, if, if T is growing, so to speak, getting larger, so we can say T is increasing, then we see the same as happening. If we even think of these as derivatives of these two functions with respect to T, X is doing the same, it's increasing and so is Y. So now we can see that the traversal has this orientation. So again, the parameterization uh, again, affords us with an orientation. So when you, when you think about curve theory and you're thinking about starting at a point and moving to another point, then you, know, you think, okay, are we ever gonna talk about line integrals? Absolutely, in calculus three. So you're gonna think, well, I'm gonna start here and I want the, uh, the uh, little, uh, I don't know, fourth dimensional car to move along this curve uh, in a particular direction. So when you create a parameterization, you need to be aware of the uh, uh, orientation. So maybe, maybe you've got a particular curve uh, or a union of smooth curves that you need to parameterize. So you start at a point and you need to move in a particular direction. So you have to make sure that your parameterizations do that. Okay, so this is, a, this is an introduction to that. And of course, you'll do more of this in Calculus 3 when you talk more about curves. So again, again, 
I'll show you more about this later, but when we have such a simple parameterization here, one way to uncover what the curve actually is, is to make an effort to eliminate the parameter and then use what you know about Cartesian equations. Of course, we know Cartesian equations. That's why we know what this is. We didn't have to plot a bunch of points here. We already knew where we were going. Here, once we eliminate the parameter and we have a nice simple Cartesian equation, then we use what we know about the Cartesian equation. And of course, these are equivalent. Whereas this may be useful uh, in certain situations, this may be more useful in other situations, okay? So very simple, but very useful. Let's look at another one. Too many examples. Okay, let me, again, organization, right? Okay, so here's another example. I got several of these. So example. We have another parameterization. We have X equals one plus one over T. And we have Y equals T minus one. And again, we wanna do the same thing. We want to sketch that is basically eliminate parameter I there, eliminate parameter, and then give the orientation. So, so when you when you think about this kind of curve, you're thinking, well, yeah, we probably do need to do a little bit here. You can you can kind of see what's going on, but in cases where you can't eliminate the parameter, it might have been like what we did before. For instance, you you would you would not look at the this, you would not look at this and say, oh, I know what this is, because we did this differently. We constructed this, okay? And so we're not gonna work this backwards. We're gonna put this in our arsenal of tools and say, okay, we did a lot of work to get this generalized form. You know, we started in this case here and did the algebra and the trigonometry. Okay, so we're not gonna look at this like we're looking at the present ones because this was a completely different construct. So you need to see the difference here. We, we may have to work really hard to come up with parametric equations, but these are gonna be so much more useful with curve theory, you know? And then of course, the, the idea is all of the theory will be, will be presented in terms of parametric representations of curves, vector functions. So now when we look at this, we'll do the same thing we did before. Notice we have one over T equivalently equals X minus one. And, and now you're looking at this and saying, well, we've got this one over T. So clearly we could have T greater than zero or we could have T less than zero, never equal to zero clearly. So you're thinking you've got two, two sections here. So when we think about this parameterization, we definitely have these values of T and we have these values of T. So maybe, maybe you may just restrict to one, or if you look at both, that may include the entire graph. Parameterizations must be studied <clears throat> because as you use them, you may not get all of the curve, okay? You may have to make some adjustments adjustments to get other parts of curves. So, so again, there may be a price to be paid when, when you actually move, <clears throat> excuse me, from a Cartesian to a parametric and vice versa. So now if we look at this, we can now reciprocate. <clears throat> so T is one over X minus one. So now this is gonna require that X is not equal to one. So we're just kind of opening Pandora's box. But now this, it, this gives you a way to write Y. <clears throat> so this implies that Y equals one over X minus one minus one. So now we have a horizontal asymptote here for free. We didn't have to divide to get it. So we see we've got a vertical asymptote at one and we have a horizontal asymptote at negative one. So this gives us a Cartesian equation <clears throat> that's basically what? Precalculus 
or calculus one, if you want to think about the calculus of this and the arithmetic of the um, vertical asymptote. So now we can sketch this. And then what we want to do is say, okay, well, what, what, what do we have here? We're gonna have situations for, for instance, when we think about this, we'll have situations where we might have values of T to figure out certain points on the graph. So first we got this negative one, we'll just kind of space it out, space it out just a little bit. <clears throat> so we have Y equals negative one. And then we have x equals one. So this is very useful for determining <clears throat> the asymptotes that we're used to in pre-cal and cal one. Okay. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, all right, well, we're gonna have to approach eventually this y equals negative one. So let's just kind of see here. If we go back to our coordinates here, we're thinking, okay, what do we have here? For instance, if we say, looking at this, if we have X equals zero, is that gonna be something that makes sense? Well, it is. So if X is equal to zero, we get, in this case, um, one equals well, we'll just go ahead and throw this over, negative one over T. So if X is zero, we get negative one over T equals one. So T just multiply equals negative one. And then if that's true, then we have Y equals negative one minus one, which is negative two. So we get a point zero, negative two, which is not surprising. So here we've got this. So that kind of opens the door to a curve that will approach here, pick this point up and go this way. So we can, we can look at this and say, all right, you know, this makes sense. So here's the point zero, negative two. Now let's play the same song and dance here, y equals zero. If y equals zero, then we have t, well, that's easy, t equals one, right, just solve. And so if t equals one, we have x equals one plus one, which is two. So this gives us the point two, zero. So same thing that we did before, so one, two, right here. So here's two zero. So we can play this game between the parameter value and the values for X and Y. Uh, once we have this, we don't, we don't wanna have to work too hard. I mean, you know, we, we don't wanna, that's too, much, too complicated. It's simpler just to say, okay, if we're gonna look for intercepts, let's just use the parametric because the equations are easy. So now we have what we think we would have, asymptotic, and then this will move here, like that. So we're getting a curve that, that tends to make sense as, as we would negotiate this in a pre-cal class, but we have the luxury of the parameterization, which makes this a little bit easier. Now, when we look at this, and we're gonna think T is gonna be uh, growing. So if T grows, notice, and, and, and this, this is kind of important. If T is growing, notice this value is going to get bigger and bigger, and the one over T is going to add a smaller contribution. So the X is going to get smaller, okay? So this would be like the T bigger than zero. This is the T less than zero as far as the parameter is concerned. And then we can think, well, of course, if, if T is getting bigger, what's happening uh, to the Y? The Y is getting bigger. So, so notice when, when, we, when we think about this, the X is getting smaller, so it's going more negative, but the Y is getting bigger. So we can draw the orientation based upon this construction, just by looking at the parametric equations. Same thing here, 
the X is getting smaller, so it's moving this way, but the Y is getting bigger, so we're going to look this way for the orientation. So with the parameterization, we get a fairly simple way to deduce the orientation just by looking at, at the particular values here from the parametric equations, nothing complicated. And then of course, when we start talking about calculus, we, that'll probably make this a little bit easier. But now, now we have a parameterization. Maybe, maybe in your work, you're only interested in this part of the curve, okay? And so when you, when you look at this part of the curve, you're, you're just gonna restrict to T positive and that'll be your, your universe right there. Or maybe you're only interested in this one, okay? So when you, when you look in this particular situation and you think about what's going on, you, know, you may wanna restrict so that you're just looking at this piece. So, so what, what's interesting here is that when we think about how we do this, and again, when the T start to be negative, we start to go on this side of the asymptote and move this direction. We just use some basic analysis here to, to, to render a problem that covers what we're interested in. So this is what I was talking about before. When you move from parametric to Cartesian and vice versa, this again is, is it's a little bit different construct. Here we just kind of beat this to death with basic algebra and we get this. Now when we're looking at it this way, we get a very different way of, of looking at the particular uh, mathematics. So the parameterization is a more elevated, is a more elevated representation of a curve. But you, it, we're not going to stop with that, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to actually parameterize surfaces. Okay, so when you talk about uh, differential geometry, you have to describe a surface in terms of parametric equations. Because again, the, the, the theory requires it. So we won't just stop with curves. We'll move on to surfaces. And you'll see that in your uh, calculus, uh, uh, calculus 3. So let's look at another one. The, the thing about the parametric equations is that they usually get very little uh, airtime. And I want to be able to make sure that you understand this. Uh, at the North Campus, we cover the material. We really do. We cover the material. We get the SLOs out. And that's what's going to help you rise to the top, so to speak. So now let's look at another one. I thought this was an interesting one. We have x is equal to secant theta. So now good old trigonometric functions and y is equal to cosine theta. Now for this particular problem, again, you, you, would, you would have to kind of go out on the limb and say, well, we're just going to be interested in certain values of t because we know this has issues at, at odd multiples of pi over two. So what the example says here is we restrict <clears throat> that is this is going to be the range the range of the inverse secant so this will be this will be a blast from the past zero to pi over two union pi over two to pi so the key here and this is what i i just articulated this is the range <clears throat> of the inverse secant so when we started studying calculus two, we started with the inverse trig functions. And so we notice here that, that this, this is having a big impact on what we're trying to do. Now, now we're thinking, <clears throat> how, how can we, you know, we can look at this and say, all right, well, that's going to give me some indication as to uh, the value of these. For instance, here, zero to pi over two, uh, the, the secant function will be, will be positive. We're fine in the cosine function, positive, clearly. But then in this realm here, these both run into the uh, negative arena. So that's going to at least give us some idea of where the curve is actually going to exist in the plane. But let's, let's just see what exactly is it going to be. Is it going to kind of look like the inverse secant function? Let's see. Let's eliminate the parameter. So now, of course, x equals secant theta. This is clearly very straightforward. This is just one over cosine, right? So now if we reciprocate, 
equivalently. So just basic algebra here, cosine theta is one over X. So now if we compare the two, we can see that Y, which is cosine theta is one over X. So this implies that Y equals one over X. So when you look at something like this, you're thinking, oh, well that, I get that curve, that makes perfect sense. And so, so now what you wanna do is say, well, if this is the case for this particular curve, how is this gonna impact? So let's look at each of these sections here. So notice if we have theta element of zero to pi over two, this is gonna mean what for X? We just think about the curve secant this says that X lives from one to infinity. So that's just where it bows up. Like, you know, when we think of the, uh, right here, this part, however two in the Cartesian, you know, we start at one and just extend to infinity. And then of course, when we're at uh, pi, we're at negative one going in this direction. So here's pi and here's zero. So that's exactly what we remember from the secant function. So that's, that's what I'm using here. So now of course, if we reciprocate X, this implies that one over X lives between what? Zero and one. And we've done, th we've done this type of construction before. And, and, and it's interesting, and you, you, you did this in pre-calculus when you were doing this exact function, reciprocating cosine. And then of course, if theta lives here, then X will live what? Negative infinity up to negative one. So this implies similarly to this that one over X will live between what? Negative one and zero. So, so the key here, the key here is utilizing what you know about the secant function and seeing how we're gonna actually restrict this graph. So these restrictions tell us where the graph is going to live. And now when you think about this, let's just kind of look, the parameter getting larger. So theta gets larger for, we'll just go ahead and do, zero to pi over two, open. So for this case, as theta gets larger, X gets larger, and so does Y. And then for pi over two to pi, open here, closed here, theta moving through this, getting positive, more positive, we can see in this particular case that what's happening, what, what, what's going on? Well, well, notice if we look at this, the Y, the Y values are kind of interesting as we move through here, what's going on? Well, we see that the X in this particular case is, in, is, is getting larger, at least in terms of the secant. That is when we think about theta moving from uh, pi over two to pi, what is happening? What is happening in the X value? So we can look at this and see that it's getting bigger. But then the Y value is getting smaller based upon this. So, so the idea here is that if we look at this and we do this easy analysis here, we can now move to the actual picture. Again, this is like we're back in algebra two and we just learned about the function one over X, but now we've thrown in all the trigonometry. So now when we look at this, we're gonna say zero to one, the one over X. So we can go ahead and plot this. So at this point, we have one, one, so we would go all the way like this, but we've restricted. So the one over X, the Y like this. So again, think of it being dotted up here, but then we start here and then here, 
we get the negative one. So we're just taking this part of the curve. Again, normally we would just keep going all the way down right here, but notice this particular parameterization selects this part of the curve. And now when we actually draw the orientation, if we follow all of this, notice, notice in this particular situation here, we've got the increase, then the decrease. So we've got to be going in this direction. And here we have increase, increase. Uh, and, and here's another thing. If you look at this and we think about this, this, this actually is going to be, this is actually going to go in the other direction, if you think about it, because the cosine here uh, will be getting smaller. So this is actually going down. So now, boom, in both cases, there we go. That looks a little better. So when you look at this, and let me make sure that's colored in, it doesn't look like it is. This parameterization gives you this piece of the curve, of the one over x curve. So I wanted to do this because in this particular case, we have a little bit more arithmetic going on, but it's all based on the secant function and then thinking about the inverse secant that, that made this comment just basically because this is the range of the inverse secant. But notice here, this is, this is not a triviality at all. You, you might be doing an exercise and you're thinking, okay, I'm just going to start off this problem and I'm going to, I'm, I'm, this, this, is, this is a really fancy parameterization. And you're thinking, hmm, how could, how could I do this and, and just keep my life a little more sane? We could say alternate. Alternate. For instance, if we were just looking at this piece, we could say something like this. R of X equals X comma one over X like this. And then we'd say X is greater than or equal to one. Okay, so that would be a parameterization for this curve, which is simple. But we started with this, and this is somewhat complicated. However, this may have merits in some other type of problem. But when you look at this, you're thinking, hmm, this is an alternate parameterization of this, which is basically parameterizing by the graph, the one over x. And then when you look at this, you could think of the same thing. You could say, okay, well, here's an alternate here. Now that we've done all this work, we can now work backwards, but obviously we had to start with this. So we could say R of X equals X and then one over X. And then we say our parameter X lives here, negative infinity to negative one. Now, you might be thinking that's kind of odd looking, but, but it is, I mean, it, it would be a parameterization and that's okay. And then in some instances, maybe you're gonna only want your parameter to take on positive values. It, it just really depends. But what you can see here is that when we start with this, we have to do a little bit of analysis to figure out that this is actually this and then think about the restrictions here as to what they mean for what part of the graph we will actually traverse. So curve theory requires that we look a little more closely. Clearly, if we just start with this, that's very straightforward. But when we start with this, we have to dissect it a little bit. And then we have to fine tune it. So as far as looking at the orientation, you can just use the up and down arrows and look at the actual curves to figure out what's going on. Nothing, nothing very difficult there. But this often gets just swept away as if, you know, oh, you just guess. No, you don't guess at anything. Everything has to work out algebraically and arithmetically. So I thought that was an interesting example and that one that actually covers a lot of bases. Now, Let's, let's now pretend like we're in pre-cal. Because you're thinking, if we've got all these nice uh, parameterizations here, you know, we already know how to parameterize a circle, the unit circle, we could just do cosine t, sine t, boom. That takes us in a uh, uh, counterclockwise. Let me just go ahead and write this in. 
here's, here's something we already know. This is what you learned in pre-cal. Let's use T. We could just say cosine T, sine T. Well, that's the, that's the X coordinate of the unit circle. That's the Y coordinate. And what would that be? That'd be the unit circle. So you already know a really useful parameterization with sines and cosines, and that would just look like this, unit circle, S1. And why do we know that? Well, X equals cosine T, Y equals sine T. I mean, this is so easy, you, you, you don't even have to think about it. And then X squared plus Y squared, of course, is just one. And now if we say T lives between zero and two pi, or just getting bigger for any real, we could just wrap around as many times as you want. This is a counterclockwise traversal basically the unit circle, okay? So, so again, there's certain uh, constructs that we've already created in our previous classes. We don't have to worry about starting from scratch. Here's, here's a nice parameterization, which we've been using ever since you learned trigonometry. And so now what we wanna do is exploit some sines and cosines, kind of like we exploited them here. So you're thinking when you need some asymptotes, you got to throw in something that has an asymptote. Okay, so, so the idea is that you, you use what you already know to introduce functions that will actually accomplish what you need. Now, with that said, here's another one. Let's think of, uh, in this case, we'll do a theta. Let me go ahead and use the vector, the vector notation that you're going to use in calculus. So we're going to say x is 3, plus four cosine theta, and y is two plus five sine theta. And here there's no specific value. We're just gonna say that, that, R, that theta trudges through the real numbers you know, in an increasing fashion. So if we wanna figure out traversal, uh, if, you know, if, if nothing is specified, we start, you know, where we are, like pick a real number, and just move in the positive direction. If we move through, what is happening to X? Is it getting larger or smaller? Or is it just staying the same, you know? And what's happening to Y? Is it getting larger, to larger or smaller? Okay, so now when we look at this, we're thinking we need a sketch and we also need the uh, orientation. Well, the orientation is going to be easy. We can see that's going to be counterclockwise just with the sine and the cosine. But what is this curve? Well, this is a curve you know actually a lot about, and we're going to we're going to eliminate the parameter. So we're going to sketch sketch curve by eliminating parameter. Now, the idea is that you can start with a Cartesian. You can start with a Cartesian and make it look like this using what you already know about sine and cosine, the trig functions. So here again, we're going to unravel this. This, this might have been something we could have started with. Our first example was more complicated than this, but I could say, okay, let's parameterize an ellipse with these particular parameters, these particular characteristics. And but otherwise, what did I say? I said, let's parameterize the epicycloid, okay? So again, when, when you produce this, it's from a constructionist standpoint. You're not, you're not unraveling something. You're trying to, okay, let, let's see how we can fit this together and get a nice parameterization other than the Cartesian curve, okay? So that's, that's going in a direction that we did with the first problem. Now we've been deconstructing in this case. So let's take this and figure out what this is. So now we can see that X equals three plus four cosine theta and Y equals two plus five sine theta. So now let's do the same thing. We want to isolate the cosine and sine because squaring is going to give us exactly the one that we need. So now we have X minus three equals four cosine theta and Y minus two equals five sine theta. So of course now we can divide and we've got the isolation of cosine and sine. So this is a nice trick. So x minus three divided by four 
and sine theta equals, well, now you're thinking we've got translation of axes. Wow, I mean, the fun never stops. Now, now one thing, one thing that, that we notice here, and let me, let me notice, yeah, this is a minus here. I thought that should be a minus. I, I set this up, so this will be a plus. Yeah, let's do that. I left the minus out there. I want, I want that to be a minus so we get a nice translation. So that otherwise it's just too simple. So now we get what? Y minus two over five. Yeah, so let's, let's put the minus three in there so we get a nice, a nice uh, translation. So now what you can see is if we square each of these equations and add them, we get the equation of ellipse. So now we can say cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals x plus three squared over four squared plus y minus two squared over five squared. Very simple. This is, this is what I teach my pre-calculus kids equals one. So this is something you've done many times. This is pre-calculus. So now you're thinking, oh, I get it, Professor Ron. We could unravel this and get to that really easily. So now you're thinking, oh, here's a convenient parameterization of an ellipse where you've got the, uh, well, that's the A because it's the larger denominator. There's the A and there's the B, and then there's the H and the K, so to speak, H, K right there. So, so you're basically saying, oh, oh, okay. So in this case, we've got what, X minus H, well, in this case, it's a, you know, we got to put in two negatives there. So this is the smaller denominator. So we're getting something like this. And then Y minus K quantity squared. Remember our convention, the larger denominator is always denoted uh, by the major axis. And we use A for that. That's our convention for ellipses equals one. So you're thinking, oh, you started with this to go this way. So this would be, again, when you think, when you think about everything that we've done here, you, you want to look at this and say, oh, this is pre-cal. This is now calculus two. So again, we get an ellipse that's translated. So basically, these are the translation equations. X prime equals X plus three. Y prime equals Y minus two, if and only if. In this case, we would have what X equals X prime minus three and Y equals Y prime plus two. So basically what you're seeing here is that the Y axis is now X equal negative three and the new X axis is Y equals two. So it's translation of axes. So hopefully this is not Greek to you. Uh, I teach this to my pre-cal kids. This is this is a linchpin of analytic geometry. I mean, it's it's required. So now, let's see what that gives us. Get a nice ellipse. So we get the y equal two. I'll spread this out a little bit so we can see it. And then we get the x equal uh, negative three, which is now the new y-axis. So if you want, let me just do this. This is y equal two, but this is just what? The new, the new x-axis, we always wanna write it the opposite way. This is the X prime, right? The new Y, X, the new X axis. And this is the new Y axis. This is the old one. And this is the old one. So, so now we have this new center here that in the old uh, system is what? Negative three, two. But in the new system, it's the new origin. So that's how we have the translation of axes. The origin moves from zero, zero to negative three, two. And that's why these equations exist the way they do. Okay, so now 
if we look at this, we're thinking, all right, well, what, what, are, the, what are the vertices? So A squared equals five squared, B squared equals four squared, and so we know C squared equals A squared minus B squared from pre-cal. So that's nine. So we take the principal square root, C is uh, three. So now we're thinking, okay, this gives us the new, with the translation equations, we can get the new foci and the new vertices. So the vertex, in this case, uh, X, Y, will be what? So we've got what, negative three, and then we have, uh, let's see, so we're gonna get the plus or minus five for the two. So we have two plus or minus five using translation equations. And then the focus, so we got the plus or minus three. So we get what, negative three, uh, and then we got what, two plus or minus three. So what is this going to give us? So this will do give us two vertices. We'll do the V1 and the V2. So we'll do negative three, seven. And then we'll subtract. So we get negative three, negative three. And then focus one will be negative three, five. And focus two will be negative three, negative one. So again, we see now that the major axis, just like we did in pre-cal, is uh, vertical. So let's go ahead and mark this. So one, two, let's see. It, it, horrible, horrible scale here. I, I, should, I should not be so sloppy. It is like, so one, two, oh, three, four, five, six, seven. Make it a little bit smaller there, sorry. So now, so we've got what, negative three, seven, and then we've got the uh, four for B. So one, two, three, four. And then of course, now we've got what? Negative three, three. So one, two, three, four, let's see. So we've got negative three and then we've got uh, yeah, this that scale is kind of kind of lousy here, but we'll we'll work with it. So we've got let's see, oh, didn't go down far enough. So in this case, I need to go two more. There we go. So basically, one, two, three, four, five, and then over here four. So one, two, three, four. All right there. There we go. So my, my, my curve is not Rembrandt, but there's my ellipse. And then let's see, negative three, five. So, so see right there. So here's V1, negative three, seven. This is kind of a blast from the past. You need to remember conic sections. So I'm doing this problem. And if you don't know them, you need to review them. This is pre-cal. And then of course, uh, V2, uh, negative three, negative three. And then uh, F2, negative three, negative one. So this is, this is what you did in pre-cal, but what we're seeing, what we're seeing in this particular case is that now, now we have a new way to basically parameterize ellipses or conic sections using sine and cosine. So this, this may be a much more useful, because you're looking here, radicals, square roots, not a lot of fun. This, free of all of that, easy calculus. So if we had to think about using calculus on this, this is simple. Sines and cosines have easy calculus. So what we're seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is that even though we have to kind of initiate ourselves into 
the realm of understanding uh, the parameterizations, we see that there is a big plus in having them, okay? But again, we, we, we like our Cartesian equations, have no problem with them. But when you consider what we're doing here, you know, we dissected this and just applied some pre-calc, that doesn't change, but this is simple. This is a simple construction here that, that is so much more user-friendly when it comes to calculus. So I thought that was an interesting example. Now, the next example, I think I've already talked about. So if you need to go back and brush up a little bit on the uh, conic sections, do that. It, it, it's not, this should all have come back to you because you study conic sections in pre-cal. And again, this is not overly difficult, but there are some conventions and there's even some uh, uh, treatment in section one of chapter 10 that gives you some nice review of this. But again, not very difficult. Now, one curve we've already talked about is the, uh, the star curve. And we're gonna do some calculus with this later on. So I thought this would be a good example. So in this case, we have X equals, this is really freaky. We have X equals the cube of cosine theta. Theta is gonna be the parameter and y equals sine cubed. Again, theta is a real number. So if you like, ladies and gentlemen, you can think of this as a vector function where the x coordinate is the cube of the cosine and the y coordinate is the cube of the sine. Now, what I thought was interesting about this particular example is that this is, this is well within our reach. We've already talked about the Cartesian equivalence here. So, so this is not nearly as difficult as worrying about the ellipse or not nearly as difficult as trying to come up with an equation, parametric equations for the epicycloid. This can just be done thinking about what we've already covered. So now if you look at this, note the following, we wanna use cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. So let's just make that happen. So if X is equal to cosine cubed, just simple algebra here, and Y is equal to sine cubed, I know this must be a lot of fun for you. I can't imagine that it wouldn't be. Uh, the, the infinite series are really fun, but this is just so much what you've been doing. So it's just a, it's just a blast from the past, so to speak. I, I think this is fun. And, and why we do this in Cal 2 is to get you ready for Cal 3 and, and it makes a great transition. So now if we think about this, we want to absorb the three, but we want to retain the square. So we're gonna say X to the two thirds equals cosine cubed to the two thirds. That is, we want to apply an increasing power function uh, that will give us the algebra that we want. We'll do the same over here, Y to the two thirds. Now this is starting to look very familiar. So now, of course, the threes absorb, so we get x to the two-thirds plus y to the two-thirds. And of course, this will just be cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And now we get this famous star curve that you remember from uh, arc length. So look at that. Th this, in terms of Cartesian, eh, it's not bad. I mean, we get a lot of plus from this. I mean, if you think about it, this is symmetric in X and Y. So this, this curve reflects in the line Y equal X. So that, that's a plus. So, and then you're thinking, well, if X is zero, Y is plus or minus one. If Y is zero, X is plus or minus one. You're like, how, how easy is that? So the, the beauty is, is that the Cartesian does give us some ideas, but it, it's kind of hard to see the cusps unless we just do a lot of derivatives, which the derivatives we do here will be simpler because these are sines and cosines. So now we can say symmetric in X and Y. So this gives us reflection 
So graph is a reflection in the line y equal x. So, so there's a lot to be gleaned from this. If you remember, uh, you, can, you can basically figure out where, where this actual curve crosses the line y equal x because x equals y, so that was easy. But let's just, I'll remind you of that. So what do we get here? We get the one, the minus one, the, the one, the one, the minus one, the minus one. So if you like, we got the one, one, minus one, minus one, and get our star curve. And of course the calculus will, will we've already talked about in terms of the arc length. Remember we just took uh, an eighth of this to avoid the division by zero. So you get this nice symmetry here. So like I said before, this purports that the curve is a reflection in the line y equal x. So this, this again gives us a way to exploit the calculus of this curve using sines and cosines. And we're like, thumbs up, because that's so much easier. So when you think about when you think about this and you're thinking, okay, well, you know, how is it we did this before? I think I recall that this is one eighth of the curve. So we would we would integrate, for instance, from this x value. If you recalled what we did before, kind of complicated, from this x value to if it were a one there or, or it were stretched or whatever, that would be our integration interval. And then we'd multiply that result by what? Eight to cover the entire curve due to the symmetry. But remember, how did, we, how did we figure that out? We just said, what, replace X with Y. And so we get, and, or replace Y with X and get two X to the two thirds equals one. So X to the two thirds equals one half. So X equals one half to the three halves. So now you're thinking, wow, this is this is kind of crazy. So what do, what do we what do we get in this case? Notice when you when you cube everything, you just get one times two times four. And then when you square root everything, you just get one over what uh, two root x or two root two two root x. So that point right there. So th this would give you the point what one over two root two. And we've already talked about that. So, so the key here is that now with this new parameterization, we have the luxury of simpler calculus. Okay, so there will be a reason for this and we'll, we'll come back to this. What I'm trying to do um, with this particular uh, series of lectures is to kind of give you some of the parametric equations that we're gonna see later. So they're not all like, you know, oh, that's a surprise kind of thing. Um, sometimes we don't have as much time. So, so I want to make sure that as we get to the calculus of these parametric equations, you, you really at least have a good feel for how they can be a, a, an advantage to you. And if you ever have some time, when you look in differential geometry books, when you look in uh, differential topology books, where, where you've got curve theory, it's all set up in terms of parameterizations. So that's, that's just the way it is. So, so this is gonna open the door for all of you all. If you wanna go to the university and take differential geometry because you're gonna be an electrical engineer or maybe you're gonna minor in math, I think this is gonna be something that will be extremely interesting to you. Now, there's a concept that we need to talk about uh, with curves, parameterizations, and that's the concept of a smooth curve. It's very simple. We've actually already talked about this. So we're gonna have a definition. So let's suppose, suppose that we have, I guess we'll just use T as a parameter. We'll say R of T in this case equals X of T comma Y of T. 
And we'll just say that T lives in some parameter interval I, okay? So basically we'll say, all right, uh, in this case, maybe, maybe we've got an X and a Y and maybe T lives from zero to one. Maybe T lives from zero to two pi. Maybe T is all positive real numbers, okay? But that's gonna be, that's gonna be a particular interval for which these have certain characteristics and I'm gonna give those to you. We say, so the curve, remember now everything's gonna be a curve uh, just to make it easy. The curve R of T is smooth, smooth, if and only if. And you're thinking if it's smooth, it's gotta have some nice continuous derivatives like we needed for what? Taylor polynomials. Number one, X and Y are what? C1, right? C1 on I, what does that mean? Does anybody remember? Remember C1 means continuous first order partials. That is, or first order derivatives. You'll get partial derivatives in calculus three. That is X prime and Y prime are continuous, just like you did in calculus one continuous on I. So when we think about this last part here, we could think we could think of this interval here from one over two root two to one as being a parametric interval if we're thinking about this particular curve where we've got a nice smooth curve. Even though we, we're cheating a little bit, we're, we're, we look at this curve and say, that, that it's smooth here, but then we have an issue here. Smooth here, but problem, smooth problem. So these cusps are, are where we say the curve is not smooth, okay? So what we would do in, in calculus three is say, this curve is piecewise smooth. We've already talked about this. We can't just mow over problems like this. That's where we just start making it up. So we see that this curve has four sections that are smooth. So we call it piecewise smooth. So the only other thing that we need is that we don't want division by zero, which is going to uh, interact with the Cartesian derivative that we show exists uh, for this par parametric representation. And then we'll say two, X prime and Y prime we don't, want, we don't want indeterminacy in the uh, derivatives, just like, it, and if we do get it, we get what we saw before, we get cusps. So X prime and Y prime are not simultaneously zero. Not simultaneously zero. And then we'll just say, except possibly at endpoints where we have a cusp, except possibly at endpoints. So there are other ways that you can write this more elegantly, but but then it would just not lit, it wouldn't stay in your brain, so to speak. So it's okay if you've got the curve that exists between two cusps, like we have with the star curve, and you just focus on that particular piece, okay? But when we talk about smooth, it, you, you can think like you're just a little ant traversing the curve and you're walking along, cruising along and it's nice and smooth, no, no potholes, no gaps, you know, so, so it's a nice smooth drive as you traverse a smooth curve. So this, this word smooth really thinks more or, or pretends that we've got a situation of a nice well-behaved curve, like you're driving on the freeway and it's nice and smooth. It, that's the geometry that's going on here. And so when you think about this, we can look at parameterizations and figure out whether or not they're smooth. So here's one thing I wanted to show you. So here's an example. We've got two parameterizations. Number one, we're gonna have R of T, I'll just put a one there, equals E to the negative T, two E to the negative T plus one. 
And for the second one, we have, we'll just say R2 of T equals E to the T and then two E to the T plus one. So what we want to do here is, is check for smooth and then just see what, what these curves are. I mean, what, what, what do they, what do they uh, define in terms of curves? So we'll say sketch and then smooth or not smooth. Okay, so when we look at this, we're thinking, all right, well, does, do these represent the same curve? They look kind of similar. And here's, here's something that I was talking about before. You can look at these and say, well, they're very, very similar. Is it going to be that we're gonna see that the orientation is altered by these differing uh, signs here? So let's, let's check that. So X, equals e to the negative t, y equals 2e to the negative t plus 1. Well, this is really simple. Well, x is e to the negative t, so if and only if, y equals 2x plus 1. That's just a line, okay? But now, now we can say as t gets bigger, the, these are decreasing functions, okay? Clearly, clearly the values of X and Y are positive. I mean, we get that for free. X and Y are positive based on these parameterizations. But these are decreasing functions. So in this case, X gets smaller and Y gets smaller. Now we've done that before, okay? Now, if we look over here, we get the same thing. We have, as far as the equation here, the Cartesian, we have X equals E to the T and y equals 2 e to the t plus 1. Well, of course, x is e to the t, so y equals 2x plus 1. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I ask you to eliminate the parameter in a parametric representation, you'll be able to do it. It won't be something where I can't do it. I mean, you, you'll be able to do it. So now we can say, all right, well, this is going to change the orientation. So now we can say x, well, if t increases, these are both increasing functions. So x increases and y increases. So this gives us a different orientation than this curve, even though the curves are the same. So that's the subtlety that I was talking about. But now if you look at this, x prime equals negative e to the negative t, y prime equals negative 2e to the negative t. Okay, these are nice and continuous for all values of t, and they're never zero. So this implies smooth. No problem here. This, this is easy, easy for this. These are nice uh, uh, continuous curves. Uh, they're, never, they're never zero, so they could never simultaneously be zero. So we get smooth for free. Here, x prime is just e to the t, and y prime, again, is 2e to the t. Again, nice and continuous. One is satisfied. And then, of course, they're never zero. So then again, this implies smooth. So this curve is smooth, which is good. Again, it's going to be great for the calculus that we're going to need. And now, when we think about this, we'll just say, OK, well, this will be easy to sketch for number one. I'm glad that I had a little bit more time to treat this because it usually just gets left out. And, you know, I don't, I don't like for, for a discussion not to be at least thorough enough so you have somewhere to start. So now if we have, uh, again, X and Y are zero or, or positive. So if, if X is quasi zero, we get what one. So we've got like an open circle here. And then, of course, if we have x equal to 2, we get a 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 1, 2. So we get something like this. But now, in this case, as t grows, x and y get smaller. So the orientation is in this direction. Now, of course, same thing. We don't have to start over. 
So we got a one and a two and a one, two, three, four, five. Open. So though, though this is very simple, but this is an extremely simple example. Notice now we get a different orientation. And maybe, maybe you need this as opposed to this. So when it comes to parametric equations, the, the concept of direction of traversal is important because when you get to calculus three and you're talking about um, vector calculus theorems, uh, mainly Green's theorem, which is a byproduct of the overreaching theorem, Stokes theorem, uh, you have to traverse a curve in a particular direction. Okay, so that's important. And the curve theory and the line integral theory is all tied into the direction of traversal. And so that, that becomes a nice algebraic arithmetic uh, routine for you that, that, that will become commonplace. But, and so this is kind of where we start that idea. So again, just remember what the definition of a smooth is, even though it's not very complicated and we've talked about it, it is an important construct. And now we can just call it what it is as opposed to just saying, just you know, avoid the issues with the derivative. Now we can say we've got smooth. Now, I wanted to share with you the uh, little construction. If you, if you, for instance, if you had two points, how could you just simply get a nice parameterization that would be useful in engineering and physics and even calculus three. So here, here's that construction I was gonna, uh, I promised you. So let's just say uh, construct parametric equations uh, for a line passing through, and we'll just label two points, so like we're in pre-cal, passing through, we'll say P is negative three comma one. No, we've used negative three before, and I didn't mean to repeat that too much, uh, uh, and Q one nine. And I'll just say here, start at P. Okay, so the idea is that we can think of this as just as, as like a vector. For instance, when you, when you think of a vector P to Q, in physics, you usually think of that. You start, the initial point is P and the terminal point is Q and you're going in that direction. So what we can do is think about these in vectors. So this is re really a vector difference. So what's gonna happen is that this will just be equal to the vector difference with Q first, one comma nine minus negative three comma one. So you're thinking, you're thinking of how do we actually construct a directed segment? That is we start at P and we end at Q, we do Q minus P, thinking of these as vectors. It's just a simple uh, vector argument that, that, that is so simple it seems difficult. And so now when you subtract, in this case, we get one minus a negative three, that gives us a four. This is the notation that's often used for vectors. Uh, uh, Larson uses this. And then we have one minus, uh, excuse me, nine minus one, which is an eight. So this provides a direction. So now, now this would imply that you can now use x equals negative three plus four t and y equals one plus eight t. And what you get with that is a very simple parameterization. Now, of course, if you start at p, you could also end at q if you wanted just a segment, you can do that. But, but now you can see here uh, when t is equal to zero, and we'll just say here, t greater than or equal to zero, when t is zero, we get negative one, excuse me, negative three and one. So we're starting at p. And if we wanted to end at q, we could just move to one. 
and that'll give us these components. But if we just want to start at P and go on at infinitum, this would be a nice parameterization with this value of the parameter. So we could say R of T equals negative three plus four T and then one plus eight T written in terms of a vector equation, T greater than or equal to zero. So when it comes to thinking about lines, you can, you can think, well, we don't have to stop with duples. We can do three tuples. So you can think about being in space and doing the same parameterization for points in space, doing the same subtraction to get the direction, and then write your parametric equation. So this will be a construct that you'll use over and over in calculus three and also in physics. You know, I know a lot of you all love physics, okay? But in order to do real physics, you have to be able to do the math in a very cogent way. Um, the, the thing about physics and, and all, and even in engineering, you got to have that foundation of the math because that undergirds everything. But at least th that's why students, especially in STEM, when they get to Calculus 3, they like it so much because it's going to help them with electricity and magnetism. Now, there was one other construction that I wanted to share with you here that, that might be of interest. This is the very last one, and I just want to just get it started. For instance, I just wanted to show you if you were thinking about a conic section, how could you transfer that to a parametric representation like we did for the ellipse? Here's an example, and I'll just get this started and write this down for you. Keep it really simple. So for instance, say we, we had the hyperbola. And I'm going to use the same notation I used last time. Say we had y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. This is where c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So when you looked at this, this would mean where you would have y intercepts and the, the branches would go like this and like this intersecting the y-axis. Okay, that's the standard. And then, of course, if you wanted, you could translate. Let's translate the axes. Then we could say y minus k, do a translation of axes, a squared minus, remember the a squared always is associated with the, with the positive term. Again, the convention from uh, uh, conic sections. So say we had this. Now, when you look at this and you think about how could we construct this in a way that we would get something that would work because now we have the minus sign, but then this is where we just say, okay, no problem, Professor Ron. We remember we have the Pythagorean identities. And so we can't really use the cosine and the sine, but we also know that one and I'll use theta here, one plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared, right? So this can give us what we need. There's the one, but we'll just say in this case, secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta equals one. So this would be a way of thinking about these two terms to use this, because when we've got the ellipse, we have the, we have the terms that are squared summed. So we can use sine and cosine. So this implies if we unsquare, so to speak, set y minus k over a equal to secant. And set, I mean, this is not, this is not magic. This is not smoke and mirrors. This is trigonometry, which I've been doing from the beginning of the lecture. Uh, again, there is nothing, there's nothing abstract about what we've been doing. It just uses all of the stuff. What is it? A student one time said, well, it's just, if I just remember everything I've ever learned about math, it's easy, right? I said, well, yeah, probably. So, so now, now when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, when you square all of this out, you get exactly this. 
So this is the start of the parameterization, so unravel it. So now y minus k equals a secant theta and x minus h equals b tangent theta. Of course, this is not unique, but it, it's certainly a usable one. So now you're seeing that this is how you can go backwards. But trust me, ladies and gentlemen, the, the epicycloid was more involved. It involved more trigonometry. This is more algebraic because we already know about conic sections. And so now we can say that y equals k plus a secant theta and x equals h plus b tangent theta. So now, now when you do your uh, vector representation, just fill it in. h plus b tangent theta, k plus a secant theta. Now, of course, this is only going to give you one of the branches, and you may have to uh, adjust it depending on what type of problem you're working with. But now what you can see, ladies and gentlemen, is that there's nothing abstract about moving from this equation to this now. You just use your favorite Pythagorean identity. So what I've tried to do today is, is bridge the gap between what we've been doing in pre-Cal, Cal 1 and Cal 2, and then merging it with the new concept of parametric representation which if you think about it, we've already been doing. We just didn't call it that. We've been working with smooth functions, but we never called them that. So what we have to do now is think about curves represented at least in terms of the graph, which is a direct transference or directed towards maybe some trig functions or directed towards some algebra that's going to make the differential curve theory that you use in calculus three more accessible. So if you have some time, just you know, Google differential geometry and differential uh, curve theory. It, you, you'd be very surprised that you'll see everything's written in terms of parameterizations where you think of everything as a vector function where you've got the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. And then as you branch into three space, you get a Z coordinate. So, so you can see now how the curve theory and the surface theory is so intertwined with physics and engineering because physics and engineering describe our world and mathematics is the language of that. So I hope, I hope this has been illuminating today. I, I know I sound like a kid in a candy store when I do this, but it is fun material. So uh, like I say, I'll send out some invitations for the uh, conference hours. And also remember, we're going to have our next test uh, next week, same time frame. I'll send out an email about that and, and get you situated for that. But, but I appreciate your attendance today. I hope everybody's enjoying the, the nice weather. I, I certainly am. And, and I, I've got to go, I've got to talk to the, the county and see if I can have my uh, new jury summons date adjusted uh, so that I can actually uh, complete the semester. I, I don't know, they might decide that they want to put me on a grand jury and that that's that's like takes forever. So I, I need to make sure I'm gonna have the time to do it. Uh, so so I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. Well, everybody have a great day and thanks again for your uh, attendance. Thank you.